मैम प्लीज स्टार्ट गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन सो आई वेलकम यू ऑल अगेन आफ्टर टू डेज ऑफ असाइनमेंट ब्रेक एंड आई होप यू ऑल एंजॉयड योर दिवाली ब्रेक सो फ्रॉम द ऑर्गेनाइजर साइड आई विश एवरी वन हैप्पी दिवाली एंड टुडे वी आर हैविंग विद अस डॉक्टर सुहील अहमद एज आर गेस्ट स्पीकर लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस आर स्पीकर टू आर पार्टिसिपेंट्स Dr Suheel Ahmed is working as a senior scientist at ICR IGFRA Regional Research Station Srinagar with over 12 years of experience his expertise lies in the domains of temperate forage crops grassland ecology and management pastoralism fruit based agroforestry systems silvi pastoral development hrd related to forage crops He is a recipient of Young Scientist Award 2020 and Distinguished Scientist Award in 2023. His impactful contributions are reflected in his extensive publication record, broadcasting, boasting 40 papers in international and national peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Ahmed is not only a prolific researcher but also an active participant in the academic community. having presented his work at numerous international and national conferences his dedication and proficiency makes him a valuable asset in the field of forage research and today he will deliver a lecture on the topic regenerative agriculture system and livestock sector a case study of forty pastoral systems so you may start with your presentation sir thank you dr ajita for your wonderful introduction uh in the beginning i welcome you all most importantly our uh, participants from across the country and i take this opportunity also to thank the course director of this uh, winter school dr gorakhmal who is principal scientist and uh, in charge i uh, ivri regional research station uh, palampur and dr ajita she is also working as a scientist there and uh, nadcl Uh, dr arisha and his entire team uh, ms uh, hamida khanam and uh, majid who have always been associated uh, with with such uh, programs with uh, uh, renewed zeal and enthusiasm thank you one and all uh, my uh, first uh, i want to uh, extend my warm greetings of uh, diwali to all of you uh, may almighty fill our lives and our workplaces with uh, abundant joy peace and prosperity uh, my top uh, topic uh, is regenerative agricultural systems and livestock sector a case study of hearty pastoral systems uh, you all know that uh, we are in a winter school that is uh, based on a theme uh, what recent advances or strides that have been made in veterinary sciences and uh, animal husbandry so it is uh, directly linked to our livestock sector how uh, can we make our livestock uh, sector more sustainable so in this particular talk uh, we will try to discover how regenerative agricultural systems uh, especially giving examples uh, from hearty pastoral systems how they can play a vital role in preserving natural resources while transforming the livestock sector this is the presentation uh, outline i will uh, start by introduction then we will uh, discuss uh, some uh, slide of regenerative agriculture then what are the trade offs and synergies between horticulture and livestock sectors then uh, i'll be introducing uh, horti pasture system then what is the link between forage production and ecosystem services then what are the constraints what are the future prospects then finally i will conclude my presentation so uh, you know that uh, when we talk of integrating two or more enterprises together there occur a number of interactions and the interactions can be uh, of complementary nature they can be of supplementary nature or even they can be competitive so our aim is to minimize the competitive interactions and preferably we should have complementary effects so this crop livestock integration Uh, is always beneficial and it is uh, said to be of complementary nature because these uh, there is an interplay of biotic and abiotic uh, factors which uh, increase the overall productivity and efficiency of the land use system on which we are working and also it is sustainability so 
uh, sustainable term as uh, you already uh, may be knowing that this came in early 90s uh, or late 80s we can say so this was a system a system can be uh, referred to as a sustainable system uh, which enhances environmental quality uh, as well as conservation of the resource base on which a particular system is based so uh, for example there are certain strategies like uh, diversity we should have diversification of plant species that enhance farm biological and economic uh, stability a uh, use of plants and animals that are well suited to farm soil and climate then we should give preference uh, for farm generated resources over purchased goods uh, or inputs that we use and it is a policy of the government that uh, they are advocating reduction of uh, agricultural inputs like we should uh, decrease the use of say for example urea and uh, that's why government is uh, promulgating natural farming or organic farming which are also part of what we call as regenerative agricultural systems so this but this uh, complementary enterprise or integrated approach they also tighten the nutrient cycles because uh, as you all of uh, we may be knowing that forest ecosystems have closed nutrient cycles but conventional agricultural systems the nutrient cycles are open so there is lot of uh, um, loss of nutrients while they are being recycled so we we need to uh, lessen that loss we need to tighten the nutrient cycles so then obviously uh, livestock integration is um, at forefront so far as regenerative agricultural uh, systems are concerned so we are concerned that uh, management of livestock uh, should be done at low densities we should have less stocking rates because we have in certain areas enhanced uh, grazing pressure the herd size is more so it should be appropriately scaled to farm size then obviously uh, soil conservation and improvement practices like use of cover crops uh, living mulch which are central to the theme of uh, regenerative agricultural systems then obviously controlled use of livestock manure or legumes to replenish or recycle the nutrient losses creation of an overall net positive effect on the environment if you see from this slide uh, this is uh, from one of the papers of Dr. Lal. Uh, he is a prominent figure in agriculture, working on carbon sequestration. That these integrated systems they they help in soil and water conservation. They help in adoption of uh, mitigation of climate change. We know that climate change is a pressing problem in today's world. Already, the the rate uh, the rate at which the carbon dioxide is, uh, I mean, uh, increasing in our atmosphere. It is it has crossed. The, uh, 450 uh, ppm of uh, carbon dioxide which was only 280 ppm before industrial revolution came so then then uh, this also if we if we talk of sustainable development goals these also help in addressing hunger because they help in diversification of produce so obviously there will be food fodder and nutritional security then obviously what is more important is human well-being there will be in increased health benefits uh, the farm income will be enhanced. There will be poverty alleviation and what is uh, the need of our, that is the sustainable land use. Now, if we uh, talk, talk of uh, regenerative agriculture, there are basically five principles. One is that any agricultural system, for example, we talk of conventional agriculture. The soil is rarely covered. We go for frequent tilling or uh, cultivation operations. So in regenerative agriculture, what is advocated that minimum soil disturbance uh, should be there. Uh, for example, conservation agriculture is a form of regenerative agriculture where they advocate uh, minimum tillage or zero tillage. Then we should maximize crop diversity. There should be crop rotation. That is incorporation of uh, legumes or incorporation of perennial crops. Perennial crops by their perenniality help in uh, covering the soil for a longer duration as compared to mono, uh, um, annual crops. Then uh, maintain living root year round because this uh, maintenance of uh, living root is important because we know that uh, this root turnover is also an important factor so far as nutrient availability is concerned. There will be increased uh, nutrient availability in the soil then ultimately that will be reflected in the productivity of plants and that will go in the chain and that will ultimately be used by the 
livestock. So integration of livestock is also central to regenerative agriculture. So my uh, topic and my aim of this talk is that how these haughty pastoral systems, because this is a case study where I will be focusing more on haughty pastoral systems, they help in at least uh, using all these principles of regenerative agriculture. So I, my focus of the talk will be how these uh, uh, forage cover crops or perennial grasses and legumes, they help in keeping the soil covered. They help in minimizing soil disturbance or maximizing crop diversity. Because if we in incorporate grass legume mixtures in a particular system, there will be enhanced crop diversity. So when we grow pasture crops in fruit orchards, that will help in integrating livestock in horticulture production systems. So uh, because of, I already mentioned that because of perennial nature of grasses and legumes, that will help in living mulch. So we will be having living root year round. So if we uh, come to trade-offs and synergies between horticulture and livestock sector, this is a photograph uh, which represents horticultural system. You can see apple, uh, having uh, in uh, alleyways and in between the alleyways what we call as a driveway or the interspace between two rows of trees that can be really well used for growing perennial grasses and legumes which will be by the livestock in this fall. So if we talk of vertical sector and if we talk of livestock sector, both sectors are important. Livestock sector I think you all know the major Majority of the participants will be from livestock. You know, it contributes about uh, one third of the uh, agricultural GDP. So is the horticulture sector. So if we integrate these two sectors together, so we uh, is the rate uh, of their uh, contribution towards GDP by so up to 60 percent. So it will be maybe 60 to 66 percent, or almost two thirds, from one third to two thirds. So these uh, horticultural systems, these are the synergies between horticulture and livestock sector that they both, both contribute immensely to the uh, gross domestic product. And in case of hilly states, for example, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, UT of JNK and UT of Ladakh, they contribute more than 40% to the agricultural GDP. So both the production systems, I mean livestock based systems, as well as horticulture based systems, they are the ideal strategies to provide food nutrition and income security to the people. So if we talk of horticulture sector, we uh, are concerned that the horticulturists, the scientists, the research diaspora, the policy makers, they are concerned with managing fruit orchards. But managing fruit orchards involves both the management of orchard trees and the orchard floor. That is the soil on which these fruit trees are grown. So orchard floor management has not uh, got that particular attention which these fruit trees or orchard trees have got. So orchard floor management is vital uh, to tree health. It's uh, important so far as yield is concerned. It is important so far as fruit quality is concerned. So standard management practices that have been advocated in uh, developed nations, they include maintaining a vegetation-free tree row and a grass-covered alleyway. You, you can uh, see the second picture. We have on either side of this is a high density orchard. On either side of the tree row, there is tillage. And in between tree rows, there is a grass strip. So this system can be very well, um, I mean, because in uh, Uttarakhand, in Himachal Pradesh, in uh, UT of JNK, there is a lot of area under apple, under fruit crops. So this system can be adopted there. And in, also in other parts of the country where other fruit crops are grown, like Amla. So we can have amla based hearty pastoral systems. We can have mango based hearty pastoral systems. Studies have been conducted on those systems as well. But here I am focusing on apple based hearty pastoral system. Then uh, this system effectively controls weeds and creates a favorable environment for the fruit trees. Now, if we come to livestock sector, we know that this is a, a main driver of socioeconomic upliftment in uh, rural India, especially. So. But so far as livestock sector is concerned, we know that livestock sector uh, also has some challenges. And one of the biggest challenges is that educate availability of quality fodder. So, and livestock wealth is more equitably distributed than that of land. 
Livestock act as the insurance against frequent crop failures that we observe uh, in so many parts of India where farmer suicides also take place. So if we take the example of Rajasthan and Maharashtra, having almost similar agroclimatic scenarios, but we can see more farmer suicides in Maharashtra as compared to Rajasthan. In Rajasthan, there is livestock sector which safeguards them against frequent crop failures. So if we then, in view of the rich interaction between crop and livestock, it's being increasingly realized that integrating livestock in a system approach would arrest the sustainability concerns, which are the keys to countries' food security. Then uh, we know that uh, farmers have limited land. The land is a limiting factor. There is a uh, focus on um, cash crops. Farmers prefer cash crops rather than forage crops. So they cannot educate, they cannot earmark, educate land for fodder cultivation. So what we have to see, we have to see the niche areas, for example, fruit orchards, where there is ample interspace available. So we can use that interspace for growing fodder crops. And we advocate growing temperate or um, this uh, perennial fodder crops, whether in central India, whether in eastern, whether in uh, peninsular India, or whether in northern India. And one more problem is that with the increase in livestock population, as you already know that there is, uh, as per census of uh, livestock census is done five yearly. So there is increase in livestock population. So we have to, we have, there is also increase in human population. So the pressure on grazing lands and pastures has also increased. Here I want to also emphasize that the grazing lands or pastures that we have they have been encroached upon. The, 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 they have been of uh, the, the forage quality has deteriorated. The forage production of grazing lands has deteriorated. So there is not ample forage production. So we have this uh, uh, challenge here. Then at the same time, one more factor is there that uh, there is a greater demand for animal products globally. And this has ha happened because of the <coughs> Oh. Dietary preference has also changed because now if you see the food plate of an, of an average individual in India, it has diversified. Earlier, it was based on cereals, for example, rice, wheat, maize, but it is now more diversified. There has been a dietary shift. So that has raised uh, demand for animal products. So we, we have to go for diversification. And in animal production systems, we know there are some pressing challenges. These points have already been discussed. For example, if you, if you look at this uh, FAO stat, which was released in 2014, you can see that four of five highest value global commodities, they are from livestock sector. And cow milk has overtaken rice. This is the case of 2014. Now it will be, I think, more products may have come so far as uh, this uh, graph is concerned. And as uh, you may be knowing that there is low productivity of livestock in India, in our country, the average yield of milk and meat, that is 20 to 60% lower than the global average. And the responsible factors, if we see, it is feed and fodder deficiency, which uh, accounts for 50.2%, breeding and reproduction 21%, disease is 7.9%, management 10.5%. Why this feed and fodder is so much important? Because if we, if we go for breeding approach, for example, we may be uh, using some elite breed, but unless and the production potential will be realized only if we give uh, it appropriate quality fodder. So that's why the its uh, ratio is more, its proportion is more as compared to other factors. Now, if we come to the horticulture sector, the average productivity of fruits is lower. And if we see one synergy here, we are number one in fruit, vegetable production. We are number one in milk production. But the productivity is low, based both in livestock as well as in fruit crops. And the responsible factors, for example, in apple, uh, it is 11.43 uh, metric tons per hectare. But if we see a developed nation, for example, Italy, which is 40 metric tons, so we are lagging behind. In almond, for example, it is 0.73 tons per hectare in JFK. The national average, although it is more than the national average, but it is less 
so far as world average is concerned. And the responsible factors are we have old uh, senile orchards, disease and pests are there, rootstock and new cultivars are there, pollination management, then poor orchard floor management practices. There are a lot of weeds which come up in the interspaces. They hamper the productivity of fruits. For example, if you see these two photographs, you can see the weed growth in the high density orchard and weed growth in the conventional. This is the pear orchard. See the, the, the growth of weeds in this. So in India, if you see the figures, the yield loss due to weeds is approximately 33% of total production. And on an average, 30% of the total production cost is spent on tillage operations. So there is a lot of uh, resources that are being used so far as um, cultivation or tillage operations are concerned. And in regenerative agricultural systems, we advocate that uh, minimum tillage or minimum soil disturbance should be there. So efficient weed control is therefore necessary for profitable fruit production. These uh, again, these two photographs, for example, a lot of weeds are there in this. Uh, this is an almond orchard. Uh, I have taken these photographs from one from the farmer's field, and one we had we had a weedy check in one of our experiments on almond-based horticultural systems. This weed is Hypericum perforatum, and this white-colored weed, this is Anthemis cotula, a very uh, obnoxious weed uh, in temperate uh, areas. This weed, if uh, livestock ingest this particular weed. Uh, during uh, grazing, the smell of uh, this uh, weed comes also in the milk. So you can see the uh, obnoxious nature of this weed. And if uh, in the previous slide, a lot of weeds uh, belonging to several uh, plant families. Uh, this particular is uh, Sinapis arvenses. Then there are this uh, red colored, this is a uh, uh, wild uh, poppy. Uh, then other species belonging to uh, like uh, Anthemis cotula. Uh, then one more species, Plantago, uh, Lenseolata, others belonging to other like uh, species. Then if we see the previous photographs and this particular fo photograph, this is the proper orchard floor management practice. You can see the clean uh, orchard. You can, in the first photograph, this I have taken from the farmer's field. This is the grass covered alleyway. And in between, uh, on either side of the tree row, you can see the farmer has grown uh, garlic on either side of the tree alleyway. And in the driveway, that is the interspace, farmer has go grown for uh, forage crops. We, we, we provided him with uh, white clover and uh, uh, festuca rubra, that is uh, uh, red fescue grass. The combination of these two, they, he gets a quality fodder. He gets garlic from this particular system, and he also gets quality apple from this particular system. And in uh, in the last photograph, for example, this is a conventional orchard. This is not a high density orchard, but you can see how good this management, how good this orchard is looking. Because the farmer, we also provided him here red clover and uh, a lolium multiflorum grass, uh, which is locally known as makhan grass in uh, Haryana, Punjab, and Himachal. Uh, there are varieties also released from Palampur University and uh, from uh, Punjab Agricultural University, so far as this lolium grass is concerned. And it is considered a very good uh, palatable grass in uh, temperate areas and in subtropical areas as well. Then uh, coming to horticultural systems, we have discussed this uh, a bit in, in, uh, in, in our introduction part. Basically, we had uh, an experiment on uh, uh, fruit-based agroforestry systems with a, one of our neighboring institutes, that is the Central Institute of Temperate Horticulture. We used a uh, few uh, legumes and uh, few grasses in this particular uh, combination. You can see the first photograph where white clover and dactylis glomerata is there. In uh, second photograph, only grass is grown. In, uh, and you can see woman harvesting uh, dactylis grass, taking first cut off in the first year. And uh, this is grass legume intercropping, uh, tall fescue grass and red clover intercropping in this particular uh, experimental plot. And last photograph, which, is, uh, which was a, a control plot where frequent tillage was done to reduce the number of weeds. 
so you can these hoti pastoral systems it's a, a system where perennial grasses or legumes are grown in the interspaces in fruit orchards so the area under different fruit plants in the state of in erstwhile state of jnk uh, was about uh, 3 lakh 38528 hectares and the area is correspondingly on the lower side in himachal pradesh and uttarakhand so there is also a lot of area almost 60% if we take the example of northwestern himalayan region 60% of the net cultivated area is under fruit crops so this is a very important niche area for our livestock sector so there exists this lot of scope in introduction of fodder crops as intercrop in orchards and this particular uh, uh, system or practice has by and large remained untapped for fodder development and this is a sustainable land use option as already we discussed a lot about this this can be a regenerative system as well so utilization of orchards as a niche area for forage resource augmentation will ensure food and nutritional security because there will be diversification we can get fodder we get uh, food uh, from this particular system we get fuel wood from this particular system which we use during winter and uh, uh, we get living mulch throughout the year in this particular system so all the principles of regenerative agricultural system which we discussed in the beginning they are being followed they are being taken care so far as this particular system is concerned so if i can if i uh, for example um, uh, give a gist of this apple based hoti pasture system this is suitable for temperate areas we can use uh, apple any variety of apple we uh, had gone with uh, red gold cultivar of apple and there are a lot of cultivar apple cultivars that are being grown now in high density as well as conventional orchard system so we advocate dactylis lolium and tall fescue grass in combination with red and white clover in temperate areas which give a fruit yield of 15 to 20 tons per hectare forage 10.9 tons dry matter per hectare and the number of acu adult cattle units which uh, 5 to 6.5 per hectare so almost 15 to 18 sheep uh, can graze in one hectare of orchard land which has been grown where the interspaces have been grown with dactylis lolium tall fescue or their combination with red or white clover so we can get uh, say for example if we use 40% green fodder that can be used from april to september and we can also conserve the uh, if the fodder production is more so we can conserve the uh, forage in the form of hay which is a usual practice of farmers in uh, ut of jnk we can also go for silage making of these temperate grasses and legumes recently we con conducted an experiment on using these uh, temperate grasses and legumes whether they could be ensiled or not so last year also we did one trial on this and this year we repeated this so they can very well be used so far as silage is concerned and one breakthrough we got during this particular year is that apple leaves are also a very good fodder they are as good as the fodders which are available in say for example subtropical or tropical areas they are almost comparable the fodder quality is very good uh, in these apples so immediately after harvesting apple fruits we can go for pruning of pruning operation in apple orchards and the pruned uh, this uh, leaf they can be uh, fed to livestock and we can also conserve because uh, in uh, most of the apple which has fallen down or which are not of good quality or which are of c grade quality they are sent to some industries where uh, apple juice is uh, extracted and after extraction of apple juice the left over what we uh, call as pomies that can also be used as livestock feed this uh, year we have uh, gone for one experiment we have used apple pomies apple leaf and some grasses or legumes in combination so uh, hopefully we will be getting very good results so far as uh, this experiment is concerned now if we see you, you know that in temperate areas we have uh, four uh, agroclimatic zones we have temperate zone we have intermediate zone we have subtropical zone 
and we have cold arid zone of say for example in himachal we have lahul spiti in uh, uh, and we have U entire ut of ladakh coming in this particular zone where apricot and apple are grown predominantly apricot but now farmers are also growing apple so this is the list of fruit crops that are grown in these particular zones the grasses list is also given what are the various forage grasses that uh, can be grown as uh, intercrops in the interspaces then forage legumes also the list is given so we can integrate all these uh, uh, practices like uh, growing grasses and legumes together as uh, as mixtures in fruit crops so we cannot have only uh, apple based horticultural system we can have walnut almond pear cherry apricot pomegranate peach mango citrus bear, bear and amla based horticultural systems then uh, coming to effect of various grass legume combinations on soil physical chemical properties if you see this uh, the treatment combinations we had uh, 17 treatment combinations and uh, we observed that uh, there was enhanced organic carbon in the uh, in the plots which were uh, uh, intercrop with uh, legumes and grass legume combinations so in the control plots the organic carbon was 0.67% which increased to 0.92% when red clover was uh, grown in combination with apple and reasonably good amounts of organic carbon like 0.7 0.76% 0.85% they were observed in grass legume combinations in when they were inter intercropped with uh, apple so we can say these uh, forage grasses and legumes especially of perennial nature they can enhance uh, soil fertility as well so we have a number of benefits coming out from this particular system now coming to this was this study was carried out the, the earlier study was carried out in apple and this particular study was carried out in uh, almond orchard we we study we had one vd check we i i already uh, showed that in the photograph we had uh, uh, several parameters like weed density and weed control efficiency and if you see the treatment combination of t8 and uh, mm, t6 to t8 we 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 got maximum weed control efficiency in t8 followed by t6 and t7 which uh, are while in we grow we had grown uh, phalaris aquatica or phalaris stenoptera which is a very vigorous grass in combination with red clover in almond orchard then in t6 and t7 we had uh, grown dactylis glomerata which is known as orchard grass locally or cock's foot grass and then tall fescue fescue arundinaceae uh, in combination with red clover with almond so we uh, we got very good uh, weed control efficiency this is basically the second year data in the third year we got weed control efficiency up to 80 85% and weed density was less in these particular plots and if you see the control plot where weed density was more than 1600 almost touching uh, 1700 per meter square so not only is uh, the weed uh, to be the uh, invasion checked in so far as this particular system is concerned but we also get enhanced soil fertility then if we if we if we if i uh, show this in the form of ecosystem services what we get from horti pastoral systems you know that e ecosystem services have been categorized into four for example provisioning services the direct benefits or tangible benefits that we get from a particular system then regulating services then supporting services and cultural services for example uh, we get diversified output in the form of fruits in the form of fodder in the form of livestock products fuel wood then genetic resources then we can also get biochar from the pruned wood that we get from uh, after pruning of these uh, branches of uh, apple we know that pruning is an animal operation so we keep on getting this uh, pruned wood from a particular system so we can use that for biochar making there are technologies how to make this biochar which again can be used as a soil amendment and which again will increase the soil fertility of the soil studies are lot of studies have been carried out 
by Indian Institute of Soil Science, so far as this biochar is concerned. Then coming to regulating services, we can have pest, disease, and climate regulation. Because you know, when organic carbon is increased in a particular system, so that helps in carbon sequestration. Uh, the, the, the carbon dioxide which has accumulated in the atmosphere that is being used by the soil. Uh, so that's what we call as carbon sequestration. That's being used by the plants as well. So this is a very, as, we, as, I, as I said, that this is a, a locked nutrient cycling system. So this, uh, these legumes, if they are incorporated in a particular system, they help also in pollination. Pollination is not only that, uh, because we need a continuous bee pasture. We need a continuous flora that can support our bee apiculture industry. So for example, red clover is a very good, uh, uh, it attracts pollinators. Then it has a very attractive flower, red color, red colored flower. Then white clover, then sanfoin, which has a pink uh, in fluorescence that also attracts uh, bees uh, or pollinators, which all ultimately help in pollination. Then water quality and erosion control, because when they, when we uh, go for uh, grass legume integration in in horti as as a, as a horti pastoral system, they bind the soil together. So the, the erosion will be less. And when the erosion will be less, so obviously the runoff, which is ultimately going in the water bodies, that will carry less sediment load to the rivers or to our water bodies. So our water quality also gets increased because of this particular system. So this is the regulating services, what we get from this particular system. Then uh, supporting services, we already discussed that nutrient cycling is tightened in this particular system. Uh, soil fertility is en enhanced. It also helps in soil carbon sequestration and biological nitrogen fixation. Because if we in if we are integrating legumes in a particular system, so definitely we are uh, we I I we have we have one beneficiary farmer. He is growing red clover as intercrop in apple trees. So we interviewed him last year. He said, "I am not using any uh, any urea any." synthetic fertilizer in my orchard because he is having this nitrogen and he knows that they go, it helps in nitrogen fixation. So uh, ready-made nitrogen uh, is provided to not only grasses or legumes, but also to fruit trees. So there will be enhanced fruit production because of this nitrogen. Uh, this, this cannot happen overnight, but it takes three to four years when the legumes get established. Then the effects will be visible only after three to four years. Then in the previous slide, I already uh, discussed about how this particular system helps in weed suppression, how weed control efficiency is increased by incorporating these perennial forage crops in this system. Then cultural services, these help in recreation. Uh, these help us in aesthetic values because the, the weedy orchard will always look unesthetic. It will not be uh, pleasing to the eyes, but if the orchard is very clean and neat, so it will be. It will have aesthetic values. People you know, have a very strong bond with these orchards. So there is some sort of spirituality. They go for, say, for example, a evening walk or a morning walk in the orchard. Then, uh, then one concept uh, on the lines of ecotourism. We have one uh, uh, agri tourism or horti tourism. So that is also a cultural service. So mm, this is. Uh, they also help in that uh, respect also. So if we integrate all these uh, services, so we get a lot of from this particular system. So again, this is uh, the slide which shows principles of uh, regenerative agriculture. Why have again shown this uh, particular slide? Uh, because now I think all of you got the idea that these perennial grasses and legumes, they help in keeping the soil covered. They help in minimizing soil disturbance. They help in maximizing crop diversity. They also help in integration of livestock in a particular system. They also maintain living root throughout the year. So all the principles of regenerative agriculture are being taken care so far as uh, these horti pastoral systems are concerned. Now, what are the constraints and what are the challenges that we uh, face so far as these hearty pastoral systems are concerned. Obviously, there is lack of awareness about the short and long-term benefits of hearty pastoral systems among the farmers and other stakeholders. 
not only the farmers but other stakeholders for example horticulturists horticulturists they don't have enough knowledge of these forage crops they don't have enough knowledge of uh, perennial forage crops what are their advantages so that also needs to be need a multi stakeholder platform where people from horticulture while people from livestock sector while pre pre people from agronomy or who the people who are working on forage crops they can sit together and devise the strategy accordingly then uh, quality planting material this is uh, generally not available we talk of seed availability in forage crops although in oat in bursim in cultivated fodder crops seed is available but uh, when it comes to perennial forage crops seed and seed or planting material is a limiting factor so that has to be taken care of uh, not uh, by all the stakeholders i mean then uh, in hearty pastures it's not that easy what we say because they can be highly productive but they are complex to design and they manage uh, because management is a bit difficult because you are integrating a tree forage animal interface so there is fruit tree there is forage crop there is animal uh, that has been integrated into the system so there is a three way interaction so we have to take care the management becomes a little bit tough in the initial years then uh, obviously inception to research extension and capacity building because we 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 do lot of extension um, under uh, tsp under scsp under meragaon meragoro programs in collaboration with uh, animal husbandry department in collaboration with sheep husbandry department few days back we had an exposure visit of farmers uh, sheep breeders from sheep husbandry department and i talked to the higher authorities to the director to deputy director of sheep husbandry department they also said that this there is a need of more extension and capacity building not only of the farmers but also of the department personnel because i i could see that the people the veterinary surgeons from the department be it sheep husbandry or be it livestock be it animal husbandry they don't have adequate knowledge of forage crops they were not able to i mean name three or four forage crops they know about oat but they don't know about what are the varieties that are suitable in different agroclimatic zones uh, they don't have any idea of perennial grasses perennial legumes so that uh, that uh, thing is lacking and that needs to be worked upon so we need multi stakeholder platforms where in all the all the stakeholders can be invited they can discuss they can devise the strategies accordingly and uh, there is a lack of a national agroforestry mission or an agroforestry board or we can say a national fodder board or a state fodder board we don't have such thing uh, like at policy at planning level although we have a national policy on livestock we have a national policy on uh, agroforestry we have a national policy on forestry but we don't have such thing so far as fodder crops are concerned so our future thrust that should be definitely on designing suitable hearty pasture systems for different land use types and agroclimatic regions so crop pasture species what are the various grass uh, grass species that are available what are the various legumes that are available they need to be identified for forage resource enhancement and for different hearty pasture systems so there uh, has to be a, a form of a bulletin or a package what we call as package of practices development of guidelines for managing animal forage and fruit tree crops that it also it requires greater knowledge as already we discussed in the previous slide because it uh, it has three way interactions so we need to devise such uh, extension material which will be having uh, animal aspect as well forage aspect as well and fruit tree aspect as well so that will help in devising Uh, or uh, designing these suitable hearty pasture systems and the farmers can adopt these hearty pastoral systems for augmentation of forage resources and for other ecosystem service benefits and this is all from my presentation thank you for your kind attention uh, if any questions are there i will be pleased to answer i hope uh, you understood my talk uh, what do you dr ajeta or uh, hamida
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir, for this very informative and elaborative talk on the sustainability of uh, the livestock feed and forages, uh, especially re in regards to the, this haughty pastoral system. And uh, rightly said that, sir, like I'm also a veterinarian and uh, I do have a very meager knowledge about the forages and uh, the 